Okay, um, just a really, really warm welcome to you all um, this evening, and thank you ever so much for, for coming. Um, this is the first of our, what we call, Curious Cow Talks that uh, we've held under um, a new division of Holton Tennis Centre, or what is now becoming Holton UK, um, called CHILDS, which stands for, as, as you well know perhaps by now, the Chilton Institute of Learning, Development and Sport. And um, we, we, we at CHILDS, if you like, we have an objective, um, and the objective is to help individuals, teams and organisations win. Right, and John is going to talk to us um, about our definition of winning, because winning really uh, requires some definition or at least calibration according to circumstances. So we have defined winning as identifying, gathering, mobilising all our resources to go as far as we can. And we have a strategy by which we're going to do that, and that's partly up there on the wall, which is to win by learning and sharing. But it's also to win by being curious cows and challenging herd wisdom and the status quo. And I suppose when we talk about um, curious cows, I don't know if you've visited the website at all. Um, there's a lot of cows on the website, so they've slapped all over the place. And there is a story uh, behind Curious Cows that some of you will already know. But <clears throat> I thought it would be worthwhile just to tell you very, very quickly the story of the Curious Cows. Um, because it really is the backdrop to everything that actually we're going to be doing through Chinese. And um, for those of you who, who don't know me, my name's Mike. Um, I'm the director of tennis here at Holton Tennis Centre, and I've been involved in tennis and sport and um, learning and development for the last sort of 25 years. Really, it's been kind of my life's work. Um, is is really about learning, uh, and uh, I spent the early early years of my life. I grew up in Kenya. Uh, that's where I was, was born and raised. When I was about 12, we moved to Arizona in the US. And Arizona is, as you'll know, it's pretty famous for cattle ranches. And um, these cattle ranches could be thousands of square miles in, in size. You know, huge, huge expanses of, of, of land. And the, the pastures are, of course, the, the cattle pastures, they're all fenced. Right, so, um, and, and many, many years ago, uh, in order to get from sort of grazing land to grazing land, pasture to pasture, you had to pass through a, a, a gated fence. And um, if you imagine the, 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 the process of actually driving up in your, as a, as a ranch hand or a cowboy or whatever you want to call it, driving up to the fence in, in, uh, in a flatbed truck, having to get out of the truck, go and open the gate, get back in the truck, drive the truck through, close the gate, get out of the truck, close the gate, get back in the truck and on your merry way. I suppose if you're doing that 30, 40 times a day, uh, just the waste in time was, was, was incredible. So a group of enterprising cowboys got together, and we'll call them cowboys just for the sake of the story, got together and and they invented a uh, brilliant invention, the cattle grid. Okay, so you're all familiar with the cattle grid. Ditch in the ground, metal bars over it, and cows stayed where they were supposed to, and the ranch hands in their, in their trucks could speed on through. Fantastic, it worked. There was a problem, however, and the problem was that at 60 miles an hour, of course, the cowboy is full of ego and you know, young guys racing through 60 miles an hour, Hell on the suspension, hell on the cargo, hell on the, on the passengers, cost an awful lot in, in, in garage bills. So, um, same group of cowboys got together again. And they thought, well, what could we do? So, they ended up, uh, which actually was quite a brilliant idea, they ended up filling in the cattle grids, 
tarmacking it over and painting yellow lines across. Cows aren't particularly smart, so why wouldn't we? We can race through in the trucks, the cows will stay where they are, brilliant. So this is what they did, and it worked. I don't know if you've passed across these before, but uh, it's fantastic. Rachel, you're looking disbelieving. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and for many years, this, this, work, this worked again, worked, worked a treat, until one morning, one morning, a young ranch hand went out to tend to his particular sort of herd of cattle, and they weren't there. And he discovered them two or three miles away in a new pasture down by, uh, down by a river, grazing happily away. So he went back to the, um, to the homestead, if you like, or the ranch itself, and um, called a meeting, sat down with his, his group of cowboys that he had been kind of, they had been through this sort of journey together. And, and this is what they, this is what they uh, surmised, was that one cow, one particular courageous and curious cow, had actually walked up to the lines on the road and had studied and inspected them for the first time for what they really really were. And she looked at them and she was, hang on, these are just painted lines in a row. Here we are, we've been hemmed in by herd wisdom all these years, all these years, just by lines on a road. And so, with great trepidation, but with loads of courage, she made that first step over the lines and ended up leading her whole herd through. You make the story what you will. It may be true, it may be false. <laughs> okay. But that is the story of the curious cows. And that's one of our strategies by which we are going to really work on our objective here, is by being curious cows, by looking to learn and to share, and um, challenging her wisdom, challenging what we might perceive as the status quo. And we're going to do that in a number of different ways. Um, we're going to do that tonight. This is the first, this is a little launch, if you like, first of our Curious Cow Talks. So we're going to have one talk a month. Next, next month, we're going to be listening to a guy called, and, and this is no lie, a guy called John Bond. And John Bond Not is yet. a typhoon pilot in the RAF. Right? He's going to be coming to talk to us about um, preparing to handle pressure. So we're going to have lots of different people coming in. Um, listening, learning, talking, sharing ideas, sparking curiosity. So that's one thing we'll be doing. Another thing we'll be doing is something called our Youth Psyche Days. So many of you will have heard of euphoria, meaning good feeling. We kind of refer to you Psyche as the good mind. Right? It's not a real word, it's made up. But over the last few years, we've done a little bit of work with a, a number of different organizations like Lane 4, the Youth Sport Trust, Ellsby Grammar School, in and around high performance teamwork, attitudes and behavioral work, that type of, that type of um, team building type of days. So uh, we're going to continue that work through Childs. So those will be our Youth Psyche days. Uh, we're holding various workshops. Um, we've had uh, some sports specific ones already, but we'll be doing in October. We'll have a, a, a specialist in to talk about momentum. And he'll talk about momentum in sport, but he'll also talk about momentum in business and momentum in your own personal lives and what that means. So that's, our, that's the type of agenda that we have at Childs, and we have this, obviously, this, what we feel is a fantastic uh, new room. Um, my brother in the back there, Stephen, he is going to be leading the conference business, so this room will be hired out to externals for conferencing, for meetings, all of that type of thing, we'll provide wonderful food, refreshments and service, so if you're ever thinking about uh, needing to hold a conference or a meeting or anything like that, Steve is the man to talk to, so that's my little plug. Um, but really what we're here to do is to listen to John tonight. And actually for the last, uh, well we wouldn't be here, and I certainly wouldn't be here in this position if, if it actually wasn't for John. Um, I've never met anybody who is more passionate about learning, sharing, growing, developing, and he has a huge amount of experience. I've been incredibly lucky over the last 12, 13 years to, um, to be really mentored by John. And um, he, he has an awful lot to share. 
and I'm sure you'll really, really enjoy listening to him this evening. We'll talk, or John will talk for, we often have to actually you know, shut him up at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Two or three hours. <laughs> but John will talk for half an hour or so, we might have some discussion afterwards, any questions, and then um, we'll, uh, we'll stop for the evening. But again, just a very, very warm welcome. Thank you for coming. Do appreciate it. And uh, hope you enjoy the evening. Brian, I think I'll speak here. I'll start by having a drink. <laughs> First thing I... Sorry. You think it's hard. Anyway, the first thing I'd like to do tonight is, is to add my welcome to Mike's, and I'd like to start by congratulating Mike on, uh, on uh, bringing this thing together. Because uh, he said a few nice things about me a few minutes ago, most of which are true. But uh, he has been a great um, leader. Uh, looking at some of his pupils over there, you know, students, Jim Miner and others, uh, Ed Holton. And it's been an absolute pleasure working with him. And I know that he's very passionate about this whole concept of um, you know, the whole thing being more than just tennis, learning, growing, developing, leadership, or high performance teamwork. Uh, so um, I just wanted to congratulate you, Mike, on bringing this to fruition. And if Nick Layton was here, who runs this place, uh, I'd, I'd say to Nick, well done for building this thing for us, because uh, it's been long awaited and very welcome. The first thing I want to uh, do is to, uh, just to add to what Mike has said, um, winning, um, I just wanted to remind everybody that I'm not going to talk about the conventional way we think about winning. And of course, the conventional way we think about winning is if someone else loses. And of course, we're in the middle of Wimbledon at the moment. I don't know quite what's going on in the match. But either Nadal or Dustin. Dustin is going to, if someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. And in a way, I don't, I don't know why we understand that. The, the, the concept of winning that we want to promote and discuss this evening is much wider than that. Um, it's much more comprehensive, it's much more complicated. And it has many more applications because it's not just about sport. We all understand winning and losing. We all got up this morning, early this morning, to hear that the England football team had lost, and the reason for that is someone got two goals and only got one. Uh, so this is all about attitude, thinking, and uh, I guess, I guess, thinking about it for a minute. The best way of describing your opponent when we talk about winning in the ways that I'd like to discuss with you tonight. Is yourself. You are battling with yourself. You are battling with yourself to see things differently as a result of seeing things differently, do things differently. And the, the biggest problem is, is, is the mental map that we have around uh, our thinking, the way we should be, and our experience. Because we tend to always go back to our experience. And it tends to be backward focus, what we've always done, what we did in the past our experience from the past, and we don't spend enough time challenging the status quo and thinking about new ideas for the future. So that's a kind of little bit of an introduction to the conventional winning and losing, which we're all very familiar with, and the kind of concept that we want to discuss this evening. Now, I, 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 I went to a talk a few weeks ago, and I was chatting to someone there, and uh, he, he told me a story about a, a talk that someone had given on a very interesting subject. And he wanted to, um, to listen to this guy, but he got stuck in traffic. And he arrived just as the speaker sat down. Just as the speaker sat down, he arrived. So he went to the back of the auditorium and he said to one of his mates, damn it, I missed it. Um, what did he say? What did he say? And his friend looked at him with a kind of weird kind of glare, a stare, blank stare, and said, I don't know. I can't remember. So he listened to this person for 30 minutes, but still couldn't remember a single thing 
that just came to mind. Now, I don't want that to happen to you. <laughs> that would be a total waste. And I don't believe in waste. So, what I like you to do is if someone walks in that door at 9 o'clock and has missed this fantastic opportunity of listening to me and go on, <laughs> uh, this is what I want you to tell them. I want you to tell them that John talked to us tonight about a new definition of winning, which we thought was really interesting, and we wanted to become students <laughs> for this definition, and it's, it, was, it was designed by a new organization, which is really exciting, called Childs. I want you also to say that he, he shared a story with us, or some information with us, which he phrased, winning by starting with why. Winning by starting with why. And finally, he also talked about winning by reinventing and recreation. Got that right? Susie, you remember that? I'll be, I'll be coming back to you later. I'll be coming back later. Um, so that's what I'd like you to say if someone turns up late. The, um, let's go back to this for a minute. <clears throat> Identifying, gathering, and mobilizing all our resources to go as far as we can. You could, you could say pretty obvious, pretty easy, but incredibly difficult. And the thing starts, you know, particularly when it comes to organizations, um, which is where most of this is applicable, this thing, this thing tends to start with leadership. Would you agree with that? I see you nodding, so you must agree. You need a leadership model that embraces this. You need a leadership model that's inclusive and a model that drives fear out of the organization, that doesn't allow people or encourage people to be scared or worried. It, it, it enables people to express their emotions, propose, <laughs> propose ideas without fear of feeling stupid or fear of failure. And that's easy to say, but incredibly difficult to do. <clears throat> because whether we like it or not, the way the world works, you get to the top of the organization, you're the boss, and you tend to start to get into the habit of telling people what to do. And of course, while you're doing that, you're actually starving them of the ability to identify, gather, and mobilize resources, because you're taking it away from them. You're blocking their path. You're not giving them any space to run into. So the leadership process is incredibly difficult. Uh, and very important and difficult. Um, my suggestion to you would be that if you're really interested in embracing this particular uh, definition of winning, the first thing to think about is yourself as leaders. And, and to become students of leadership. Because if you do, you'll find it fascinating. It's very, very interesting. It's relatively easy to do if you get it right. And you'll find that you'll have more time to yourself and you get more results. And you'll find that your organization somehow becomes empowered. And instead of having to figure out the answers to all the questions, the problems, you'll find people coming to you with proposals and ideas and increasing the resources that are around us. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. Now, the other thing to mention briefly before I move on is if any, any of you do become students in leadership, I can thoroughly recommend this book by a chap called Alistair Campbell. It's called Winners. And it's got some fantastic um, descriptions of leadership in different forms and, 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 and attributes the, the, the characteristics to sports, top sports people, business, politics. It's really interesting. It's a big piece of kit, but it's worth, it's worth a read if you're interested. And I think you should be. And the next thing that winners, that, that leaders do, is they 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 realise that resources are quite frankly abundant. Uh, often managers, people who are managing static situations, see resources as rather restricted, rather limited, and they get a, they get, a, they get a bit worried and concerned about that. Whereas 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 when you get into a situation where the leader is fostering high performance teamwork, for example, then suddenly resources seem to be in greater supply. And the, the thing about teams, um, most organizations you go into, 
uh, you'll find loads of teams, or people, groups of people that call themselves teams. And the truth is that there are very, very, very few real teams. They're fundamentally groups of people who have got separate agenda, meeting every now and again to discuss various subjects. I see some, a little bit of nodding going on here. And the reason for that is no one has really studied the qualities and the characteristics of teams. And it boils down, as usual, to language, to attitude, to try all sorts of things that are very obvious to you, but unless you actually practice the concept of teams, you won't ever, ever have a real team or a high performance team. You'll think we have a team, but in fact, you've got a group of people who don't have a common goal. You'll have a group of people that talk to each other in a particular way which is not terribly helpful and creative. The wrong language and therefore the wrong results. The best way to what we do at Halton to um, demonstrate the importance and, and uh, impact of teamwork is a, it's a, it's a, it's a silly little idea that one of the guys mentioned, some of you all know this, a few weeks ago when we were having a session. Um, would we compare these two numbers, 43.18 and 36.84. And what I could do, I'd like to spend five minutes asking you to guess what that is. But, you know, you get it in less than five minutes, so I'm going to tell you. 43.18 is the world record for the 400 meters. Held by Michael Johnson, I think he said that in 1999 in Berlin. And 36.84 is the four times 100 meter world record, which was set, at, I think, in London Olympics 212, Mike? 2012, Mike. You say Bolt and the other three of us. So there's quite a big difference, isn't there? Power of teamwork. Now, do the maths there, and you'll probably find that there's between 15 and 20 percent difference in those times. So you can imagine identifying, gathering, and mobilizing more and more resources through the power of teamwork, and increasing our turnover by 20 percent. It seems to make a lot of sense. Um, the other thing to say about teams is that there's a very good video uh, of the 97 Lions tour to South Africa. Uh, we saw it a few months ago, didn't we, when we had someone over here to talk to us. And uh, the Lions have been going down to South Africa, well, they've been going for years, and they hadn't won in 23 years. And uh, they needed a new strategy. And they decided that their simple strategy was going to be high-performance teamwork. They, they obviously had their star performers, but they decided that it was going to be an intensive study and practice of high performance teamwork. And they, the video shows how they did it. And, and, and the quality of the communication, the quality of the understanding, the quality of the support, not only by the people on the field, but the whole 40 or 50 of them, how it worked right from the beginning, right through to the end. So if you're interested in teams and high performance teamwork, I would definitely recommend having a look. I think you can get it on YouTube, my point. Um, and it, if, you, if you get it right, you can have an enormous impact on the results. The other thing that um, Mike mentioned earlier, which I think is an important part of this, and this won't be any surprise to you, and that's Curious Cat. Being a Curious Cat. I still can't quite get used to that word cow, but I'm getting used to it slowly. Because curiosity is absolutely vital to any form of growth. It's impossible to grow or develop in any way unless you can ask questions. We start using language like, it's not my thing, I don't do that, I've learned enough, I'm okay, I can get by, we're finished. And the whole idea behind winning is growing. So the concept of curiosity is vitally important. And do you know something? 
As we get older, and as we get more responsible positions, we lose it. We think we know it. You know, I'm pretty ancient. You know, I don't know how I got this job, by the way, but anyhow, it's another story. Um, it's amazing how we lose it. We start to make statements instead of asking questions. And it's, it's, it's a showstopper. Because we're actually telling ourselves that we've learned enough. There's nothing else to learn. Which I think is a dreadful proposition, don't you? <clears throat> so being curious is at the heart of winning. Being curious, I mean, I guess if Mike were talking about tennis tonight, he'd be saying, no, I think we need to talk a lot about the game, a lot about you know, the questions that you may have and I have about how we're going to, we're going to get better results. And it's curiosity that starts to fall off. The, the, the other thing that I thought I'd share with you briefly tonight, uh, something we worked on here at Holton, and uh, this isn't a plug for Holton because um, I, I've worked with quite a few organisations over the years, and including running a, a large multinational with a few billion turnover and about 7,000 people. And so, so I, 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 I mean, I, it may look as if I've spent all my life here, but I did actually do a few other things and they were quite enjoyable. Um, what we did um, years ago, I met a chap called Larry Wilson in the US, uh, who talked to me about something, a concept that he had called Playing to Win. And I thought, being too many prisoners, isn't he? I need to learn here, you know, I need to learn here. And, um, he persuaded me to stay on. I was, I was at a meeting in the US and I wanted to get back home, but he persuaded me to stay on and go down to Santa Fe in New Mexico to learn about his thinking around playing to win. And the, you know, there's a three-day experiential learning program that we all did, which you know, I won't bore you with, but basically meant starting off by scaring you to death and then having a discussion about what happened to you. Um, but this guy was very influential to me, very important because uh, I was taking the company through an important phase of change. The company that I ran was made these things, carpet tiles, amongst other things. And um, the guy that I worked for, who was the founder, decided that he wanted us to change the thinking, change the vision from being from 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 being the first name in commercial interiors globally to being the first name in industrial ecology, to being the first organization to show the entire industrial world of environmental sustainability in all it was in all its dimensions. Quite a tough task. So I needed something. I needed some kind of philosophy to help making that track to make that transition. And by the way, we still had to stay profitable, keep the shareholders happy. And this guy Larry Wilson helped me. And he helped me by teaching me about learning teaching me about the two basic games that we play in life. Because I'm an accountant, you see, so when my boss said to me, I want you to make this organization environmentally sustainable, I immediately said, typical, can't do it. I'm an accountant. I can add and subtract, but that's it. I'm limited by that kind of limited belief. I don't understand all this stuff. But Larry helped me, and he helped me by saying, look, John, the thing is that you're playing the wrong game. So I said, what game am I playing? He said, the game that you're playing is playing not to lose. You're playing a game that's based on your experience, and you keep going on about the fact you're an accountant, which I admit is a pretty nasty thing to do. <laughs> but you keep going on about the pocket. You keep telling me what you did. You keep repeating the patterns of the past. It's all irrelevant. We're talking about the future. We're talking about a new model. And he taught by going through this, this process of learning to play the win, which is simply about this, growing, learning, developing, grasping discomfort to grow, all those kind of phrases that we got familiar with. Seeing resources as abundant as opposed to very limited. Being more creative. Taking more risks. Failing fast. And learning from those experiences. That was all what it was about. And we had to do that because there's no way we could have, we could have made that journey 
to environmental sustainability without making loads and loads of mistakes. How do we continue to play the old game, playing not to lose, which is repeating the patterns of the past, looking back, being very fearful, fear-based thinking system, would have never made any progress at all. Now that particular company, even though it's relatively small by world standards, a couple of billion turnover about, I think it's slimmed down a bit now, and it makes these silly things called competence. It's one of the most admired companies in the world. People want to do business with them. Big for that. And that's where play, that's where I found playing to win. I'll get commission on this one. <laughs> um, recommend this. It's an interesting book. We've used it here, Mike, and we've heard it, and it's worked very well. And it's all about a kind of culture of growing, a culture of learning and developing. And it's very much in line with, with this particular definition of winning. Okay. Right, so that's that. So that's that bit about this. Now let's move on to what I said that I'd talk about for a while, which is winning by starting with why. Now, how many of you listen to the TED Talks? Because some time ago, uh, I, I, my son, I think, Steve, uh, sent me a, um, a uh, connection to a particular TED talk by a guy called Simon Sinek. Um, and he, um, <coughs> so I'm going to steal some of his material, if you don't mind. Uh, some of those who have seen the real thing, you know, say, mm, I didn't like that very much. Uh, but others won't know. <laughs> So but um, he, um, he, um, he starts his talk by saying, how do you explain when things don't go quite the way you assume they should go? Or, better still, how do you explain when some people have the ability to defy all the assumptions and get the kind of results that seem Amazing. Why, for example, is Apple so innovative? Why is it Apple? I mean, why, I mean, year after year after year, they produce these fantastic products, and I think they're just about to bring radio. I think they're, they're just about to launch a radio product. Why is that? I mean, they're just a computer company. They've got the same access to the same resources as anybody else. Same human capital, same economic capital, same consultants. Why? Why then? <coughs> he goes on to talk about why did Martin Luther King manage to lead the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only great orator of his death. He wasn't the only person affected by, by the pre-US civil rights situation. Why? Why him? And why did the Wright brothers figure out the answer to power, control, and man flight? When other organizations at the time were much better capitalized, they had much better access to all sorts of resources, why did they do it? And the other people didn't. And at the heart of it, he concluded that all these organizations that I've mentioned, and others, and leaders, think, act, and communicate in a particular way. And it's completely the opposite to the way most others communicate, or most others think, or the most others act. And he said it dramatically changed his thinking. Uh, I think he said about three and a half years ago he kind of discovered this thought. And he said what he what he then proposed to do or worked on doing was simply codify it. He, 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 he reduced it to a simple code. And he calls it the Golden Circle. And it's probably the most simple idea in the world. <clears throat> Why, how, what?
Everybody on the planet, every individual on the planet, every organization on the planet, is what they do. We're a tennis club. We've got 16 courts, a few coaches, and teach people to play tennis. Few of them know how we use special technology, special IP, differentiation. Very, very few ask why. And when I say why, I'm not talking about profit. That's the result. I'm talking about what we believe in. What's our cause? Where do we get out of bed? Why do we care? So it's something different. And he goes on to explain that most of us don't move, don't talk, don't think about why. We 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 describe everything we do in terms of the what and the how. So if you imagine um, Apple again, using Apple as an example. The typical message from Apple would be, we make great computers. They're beautifully designed, user friendly, and easy to use. Want to buy one? Doesn't sound too tantalizing, too inviting. But the way Apple really communicates, starting the other way around, from the inside out, they start by saying, we believe in challenging the status quo in everything we do. We believe in thinking differently. How do we do that? We do that by making, designing beautiful computers, easy to use, user friendly. Want to be our partner? Totally different message. Totally different message. Same content, but a totally different message, just simply by putting it in a different order. Because fundamentally what we, what we assume, if you think of it the other way around, we say, this is what we do, this is how we do it, buy our product. The great thing about this is that we attract people who hopefully believe in what we believe. And we start to be able to do business at a higher level, and we're going to come to that in a few minutes. I don't know if any of that makes any sense to you. I see a couple of people nodding. But the interesting thing about the Apple example is that his proposition is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And because of that, and because of this system of communication, we're very comfortable, comfortable buying a computer from Apple. We're very comfortable buying an entry MP3 player from Apple, or a iPhone, or maybe a few other things. Because we have developed a relationship now with Apple that's stronger than just the product, what we do. So his proposition is, people don't buy what they do, or what we do, they buy what we do. And that is a simple example. If you take the Holton situation, which we know reasonably well, people from the Holton here. If we were like any other club, we would say, we're a tennis club. We've got 16 courts. We've got a few coaches. We all my social tennis on Tuesday night. Join the club. Here's your money. That would be it. And that's how most tennis club, is that right, Aiden? That's how most tennis operate. So is that? Sounds about right. Not terribly not terribly exciting, not terribly inviting. What we could say, and what we do say, I think, is we believe in changing the way British tennis runs and operates. We actually believe in something called the complete tennis experience, which, which means we have to recognize that we have to ask our customers what they want as opposed to assuming. We also believe in what you see when you come through the drive. We believe in each individual 
and talented, each individual, different, but all valued. A totally different starting point to the conversation. How do we do that? We do it by asking questions, we do it by finding out what people want, we do it by creating a model where Terry and I can play at this club, as uh, Golden Old is. He's slightly older than me. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, we can have an academy with high performance kids with Katie Dunn and others. We can play team tennis, we can have grumpies, we can have this. We believe in that integrated model. And it's on the board as you walk in. And to do it, we have to accept that everyone's view of the complete tennis experience is different. And we have to be curious cats. And we have to have the courage to ask people. And then we have to have the creativity to create products that are going to satisfy that demand, as opposed to just selling them the same old membership. So that's the, that's the concept of why. I propose, I would suggest to you, if you're running a business, Jim, we were talking about this earlier, if you're running a business, start with why. And there's no doubt in Sinek's mind and in my own mind as well, that the great leaders who can inspire action start with why. <coughs> okay, so that's the second thing you've got to remember. I'll be coming back to that in a minute. Um, the other thing I promised to talk about was winning by reinvention and recreation. And I need a prop to do this. This is something that the Halter Knights here, and many of you may recognize, <coughs> something they call the growth curve. It's part of the uh, vocabulary here. There aren't many weeks go by that I don't mention it in some form or another. I believe strongly in it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of research that took place years ago into um, companies, organizations, teams, institutions, and it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the study of what happens when we start something out, the formative phase, what happens when we get into what we call phase two, the normative phase, and what happens when we hit the wall, you know, we're doing more and more work, we're working harder and harder and harder, Rob's nodding as I'm telling him the story because he's heard it before. Uh, and we're not getting the results we used to get. Typical organization. So we have to make a decision about what to do. And most of us, because we're fundamentally wired into playing not to lose, <coughs> the general view is that we go back. And we go back to basics. And in some respects that could work. But most of the time, it doesn't because the landscape has changed, competition has changed, the market has changed. So we have to kind of work out um, how to handle this situation where we've, we've come through phase one, we've got into phase two. We, the, the purpose of phase one, the aim of phase one is to get out of it into phase two, so you can kind of normalize the business. What typically happens is that the entrepreneurial flair in phase one was replaced by systems and procedures in place in phase two, and you know, the energy in the organization starts to fade. It's not quite as driven anymore as it used to be. The management focus moves from lead in phase one to control in phase two, and the thing starts to die. And of course, then there comes a point where we're all exhausted and we have to make a choice. And my proposal to you is that we enter phase three, which is the reinvent effect, where we have to kind of look at things entirely again and reinvent the way we do things. The story I told you about my old company interface to some extent is very similar to phase three because you know, we were doing all right, making and selling this stuff, but we weren't getting the results that we hopefully get, even economically. So by reinventing the business around the concept of environmental sustainability, we actually gave it life and you know, created a situation where it has and still is extremely successful. So that's reinvented. And there are one or two things, one or two characteristics of, 
of uh, these three phases that I thought I'd just talk you through very briefly. Um, if, you, if you think about, say, take the customer. Sorry. If you think about the customer, and we often tell the story here at Holton, you know, when, when we're starting out, we're totally dependent on the customer. In the same way that we're dependent on our next heartbeat, he was alive, we're completely dependent on the customer to keep us going. And if Mike brings me, I'm a tennis coach, he's a chairman, brings me uh, sometimes says, look John, I'd like a lesson at 9.15 on Sunday evening. I'd say, right, you're on. I'd be there at 9 o'clock, sweeping the court, checking the nets, and hopefully I would give Mike a very good lesson. Because of that level of dependency, because I've now got me on his art, unless I, I live or die by that customer. But what happens when we move on, and we start to think about the kind of normalizing phase, we start to assume that we own the customer. So we start to move our thinking away from being dependent on the customer to being independent from the customer. So when Mike makes a call to say, okay, for next Sunday, I say, well, Mike, thank you very much for calling me, but it's not convenient. I might better fit you in at 10.30 on Wednesday morning. So that's that move in the way you think about the customer. And of course, in phase three, we need to reinvent things in such a way that we start to develop a new relationship with the customer, which is internally interesting. And we did that at Halton a few years ago by having masses and masses and masses of forums where we discuss what the customer wants. We involve the customer in developing the product. We did that at my old company, obviously, when we moved on to environmental sustainability. We couldn't do it ourselves. We had to actually involve other people in getting us to think it through. And, and, and create another basis for doing business, another basis for hanging out with us, as opposed to, you know, not just about the product. So it had to be more than that. Management style in phase one is lead, two, control. Anybody work for a phase two company here? Policies, procedures, control, that's the key thing. Whereas in phase three, the emphasis moves from the, to develop. Measurement focus, star performance in phase one, phase two function and job description. Now, by the way, I'm not proposing that any of this phase two stuff is bad, because you need structure. We need function and job description to some extent. The problem is that it takes over, and it drives out all that entrepreneurial flair, drives out all that drive that we had at the beginning, drives away that attitude that we had in phase one to the customer. There's nothing wrong with it, but what tends to happen is it just completely takes over and destroys the energy, the curiosity of the organization, which is why we need to go into the reinventive phase. The task in phase one is to invent, create. In phase two, it's more or less to refine what we've already got. And, of course, in phase two, it's to innovate and to recreate. This is the interesting one to me, having worked for a few businesses over the years. The goal, if you're starting out, and your phase one goal is to get out of it, because what you want, you want relief, you want a bit more normality, you know, the stress is killing your phase one, you know, having this heavy dependency on the customer. So the goal is to get out of it. But when you get into phase two, the goal is to keep it going. It's a bit like the LTA. Some people might say their, their main aim is to promote and improve British tennis. I'm not sure about that. That's my personal opinion. I think the goal is to keep it going. It's an institution that has its own need, apparent need, to keep going. And I won't go into that in too much detail. And what happens then, of course, so, Aidan, do you agree with that? No, I did, yes. Uh, Good. You, could, you, could you can you disagree with me anytime you like. Longer, longer, uh, longer <laughs> so, and the, the problem here is, you see, you get, you get a typical phase to organisation where you've got managers and, 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 and senior people who have busted gut to get into their management situation. 
You're right. <laughs> the only one I understand what I'm talking about. Plus, the gut to get into uh, management positions, climbing up and playing politics. And they want to keep it going. It's too scary for them to reinvent. It's too scary for them to give birth to the new They want to kill it off. So there's a massive amount of resistance. And I mentioned the LTA because everybody kind of knows a bit about it. But it doesn't only, it's not only the LTA, it's many, many organizations that don't really want to have this kind of inertia because people uh, actually like the status quo. They want to maintain it. And of course, the, the phase three goal is to, is to reinvent, which is to some extent what we did in, did in Holton, because we were a failing tennis club. Uh, we now, hopefully, I don't want to be too, over, I don't want to over egg it too much, but at least we're moving forward, we've got a big business, and it, it, you know, we've got more customers, and we've got a bigger game to play, and we've got some big new ideas for the future. That hopefully we can make work and you know become successful. So that's a little bit about the growth curve and the concept of reinvention. So what I'd like to suggest to you is that you start to become students of the growth curve and start to understand the phases of organizations, individuals, teams, groups, families, and how it works and how you can encourage this thinking here around reinvention. Okay. So, if someone walks in now and says, what are you talking about? What are you going to say? <coughs> oh, God. Can I give you, while you're on that page yeah, too, sure. can I give you a perfect example yeah. of, of an industry that completely took all the customers for granted. Uh, when I was a young man, walked up every high street. Who had the most expensive property? Every high street in the country. The bank is in the street. We were all next door to each other. Lawyers, England, New England, they were all there. We were all yeah. doing the same thing. Except, were they thinking of their customers? Because most people who go to work work Mondays to Fridays. Do banks own money? No. Saturday and Sunday, they're off. When the people are off. When they started out, out in banking 250 years ago, they were open all the time. Mm. Because they were, but they got so powerful. Yeah. And then they got so powerful and so rich, mm. they started selling people who didn't understand insurance. Mm. Mm. They started selling all sorts of things. Mm. And that was perfect phase two, was it not, John? Absolutely spot on. Yeah, they're too. having to change. They're having to change in the course they're in. Fine. And it, you know, when over the bank that you know, three days a week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good it's a good example, Terry, and there are more recent. Not examples. interested in making more money. <laughs> they are they're changed in they're too bloody lazy they, they, they changed to becoming gamblers and <coughs> almost not going to the market. But um, but the other the other more recent examples of what Terry's just said are Tesco's. There's a lot of examples. A lot of examples. Their assumption was... What happened to Wolves? Well, oh, they got those down. Yeah, well, their, the Tesco's assumption was that 30, 40 years ago, we wanted out-of-town shopping, we wanted to go out every week and do a week shop, uh, get everything for the family, fill the car up, go home. That was it. Of course, they didn't realise that shopping changes were changing, apart from the Aldi and little thing coming in from Germany. But they didn't realise that that was changing. And what happened to them is not only did they lose market share, but they got to a point where they got so arrogant about their market leadership that they started to cheat. Yeah. Remember the, 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 the scandal about their reporting and everything else? Before that, Kodak. Kodak yeah, were the right. world leaders in the old kind of field said, yeah, digital, and then catch on. John. Sure, Typical we, phase two thinking. Sure, that was the food company who did wake up. Whitbread. Yeah, Whitbread, yeah. They, they, they went into coffee. Yeah, more than that. Possibly, yeah, more than that, yeah. But they went into... They went into three businesses. Yeah, they, but apart from, apart from that, they, they went into... They yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
But you know that's that's uh, um, that's the um, that's back to that. Um, so let, let me just ask you that final question, then we're going to have a drink, uh, or I'll get uh, Mike to come and talk to you. I get terrible. Well, I can tell you. I thought you would. I'm older than anybody else. Because yeah. so I still remember going to Wimbledon and seeing Chris Evans turn up. And I'd never seen anybody hit a double handed backhand before. What did she do there? She turned up at Wilbur. You know. Phase three. <laughs> she, yeah, and now it's not everybody, but most people do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's phase three, Terry. So, so let, let me just remind you, thank you, let, let me just remind you, Chris. I get you. A drink is faithful. <laughs> uh, but let me just remind you of what you should say. Because I don't, I don't trust you. <laughs> I trust you. One is, I want you to remember this definition of winning, which is gone. But you know, can you remember it? Mobilizing resources. Not bad at all. Identifying. Gathering. And mobilizing. All our sources of resources to as we can identify the gap. Identifying, gathering, mobilizing all our resources to go as far as we can. The second one was winning starts with war. Winning starts with war. Great leaders who inspire action and win start with war. That's the second one. Got it? Mm -hmm. What was the third thing? Stop that. Reinvention. Reinvention. Don't go down the Tesco route. Don't go down the, down the <coughs> don't go down the Kodak route. Get reinvented. That's way, that way we'll keep winning. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
all the mineral, financial, military wealth of the US to go on and help win the war. So just to leave you with that, that little story, and just a big, big thank you for, to, to John. He's, he's thought a lot about this, prepared a lot. This hasn't just kind of, you know, or uh, looks like it's just off the cuff. Um, he's done a lot of preparation for it. I really appreciate you all coming to um, what has been a, a, a small launch of our Curious Cow Talks. 31st, if you want to listen to John Bond, um, <coughs> he'll be here talking about handling pressure. That's something that might interest you. We're getting a lot of our um, athletes to come and listen to him. Will you be emailing that information out? Yeah, we will. We will. He's You've got your email now, we'll start. No, you'll regret that. <laughs> Not a problem. So, so he'll be talking about preparing to handle pressure. Um, that's something that we're all involved in in various different ways, <coughs> form, I imagine, whether it's um, whether it's uh, you know parenthood or whether it's business or whether it's uh, the sports field, we're going to invite a lot of our young athletes to that, um, so that might be something, David, we can get some of the, the kids down to, David coaches my son's uh, football team, so he's our manager. Mm -hmm. So is that like a, a free issue thing? Pardon? Is that a free, a free attendance? Yeah, all, all, all our Curious Cow Talks are just, that's what they are, just free attendance, it's just to sign up, <coughs> so yeah, it's just to spark curiosity, share ideas, get people together, and then we can flog a few of other things that we're doing. Whilst we're, whilst we're doing that now. In the end, we'll get your money. We'll get your money. Don't worry, you're going to be playing tennis. I'll just up my charges. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, for the moment, stay around, have a drink, have a little bit more food. Um, thanks again, John. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I hope you enjoyed the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.